already introduced him last night. I will not take any more time to introduce him. All I can say is a very special privilege for me, a person one third his age, to be able to, on behalf of the navigators, welcome him to speak to us this afternoon. While you get your pen and files and Bible ready, we'll ask the Nav teens singers to come and sing us an item, after which Mr. Sanders will come and deliver the Lord's message. Okay? Bernard? I know an afternoon meeting, especially when there's no air conditioning, is a difficult meeting. Uh, I remember preaching at Carabas Close in Edinburgh in Scotland on one occasion. It was a Saturday night. It was quite a large hall. It was filled with people. And there was a male choir. They came from Greenock in Scotland. And most of them men were minors. They sang very beautifully. And then some of them gave their testimony. There was one of the fellows gave his testimony. He was that kind of chap... It didn't matter what he said, it sounded funny. He had the, that kind of a way about him. He could make the ordinary thing sound humorous. And he, uh, he, he made his testimony very interesting. Then he told this story. He said there was a minister having a Sunday afternoon meeting in his church. And he said the afternoon was very hot and the minister was very dry. <laughs> And he said he hadn't been preaching very long before an old man in the front began to nod and then he went off to sleep. And this annoyed the minister, he said. And so at last he said to a boy sitting next to him, Give him a dig in the ribs. And the boy looked up, he said, No, I won't, sir. You put him to sleep. Wake him up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to sleep this afternoon, I won't blame you. I'll blame myself. <laughs> I won't ask anybody to dig you in the ribs either. Would you read with me please from Luke's Gospel chapter 14. Luke's Gospel chapter 14. Reading from verse 25. Now great multitudes accompanied Jesus and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You notice that three times repeated statement, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus didn't say he may not be my disciple. He didn't say I won't allow him to be my disciple. He just made a statement of fact. He cannot be my disciple. He can't be my disciple because he's not of the quality, he's not of the kind that my disciples must be. Therefore, he can't be my disciple. He can be a believer, but he can't be a disciple. You'll notice in that passage too that the Lord uses two illustrations. In verse 28, he speaks about somebody who is building a tower. 
And then in verse 31, he speaks about a king and the enemy. And he uses those two figures. He wants some, he wants young men, young women, older men, older women, whom he can use in building his church. He wants those who are of a quality to help him in battling against the enemy. And the type of person that is required for that is pointed out in those three verses. There are given to us in that passage the three of the conditions of discipleship. Now before I get right on to that passage, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that after his resurrection and before his ascension, our Lord said to his disciples that the gospel would be preached. R repentance and remission of sin would be preached to all peoples, beginning at Jerusalem. And then in Acts 1.8, when he gave to his disciples his final instructions, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You notice that in both those cases, in Luke 24, 49, in Acts 1, 8, the Lord says, begin at Jerusalem. Why did he suggest or why did he command that the disciples should begin at Jerusalem? Well, I think the first reason was that it was the hardest place. If they could make good in Jerusalem, then they would be able to make good elsewhere because this was the hardest place for them to witness. You just think of the situation. They had no money. They were not financial. They had no influence. The religious leaders were bitterly opposed to them. The Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish authority, were filled with fury because their plans had failed. King Herod was still alive. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were bitterly prejudiced against their message. The priests who felt threatened by that message were mad against them. And here were these men. And the Lord said, now you go in that situation in Jerusalem, the hardest place, and you begin your witness there. I think you'll agree with me that if they were able to make good in Jerusalem among those conditions, then they would be able to make good elsewhere. The hardest place was the challenge because it was the place where they had failed. How bitterly they had failed. At the last moment when Jesus was on the cross, when their presence, their loving support would have meant so much to him, they all forsook him and fled. They had failed bitterly. And even after his resurrection, they were dead scared and says they were hiding behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. They didn't sound a very wonderful bunch of people, did they? And the Lord said to his disciples, Now I want you to begin your witness in the place where you have failed so dismally. I wonder, have you failed somewhere? Have you failed in your witness at home? Have you failed in your witness at university, school? Have you failed in your witness in business? The Lord says, all right, begin there. Beginning at Jerusalem, the hardest place for you to witness. Prove yourself there. We needn't think very much about service elsewhere unless we can make good in the place where we are. A second reason why Jesus told them to begin at Jerusalem was that Jerusalem deeply needed the gospel. With all their privilege, with all their prestige, the people of Jerusalem were in desperate need. 
You remember when Peter preached that wonderful sermon on the day of Pentecost? It was to the people of Jerusalem that he said, You, this Jesus, you have crucified. They, he, they were to witness to the very ones who had crucified the Lord of glory. Another thing, unless they had begun at Jerusalem, they would be unlikely to go further abroad. It was going to be the testing place of their sincerity. How sincere were they? They were to later witness in the temple. Imagine that. They were going to be witness to the whole city on the day of Pentecost. And now the Lord says you are to witness in Jerusalem. It was an indication of our Lord's great love for Jerusalem. It was that city over which he had wept. I stood outside the walls of Jerusalem once and uh, my Arab guide pointed me to a building on the side of the hill and just on the opposite the walls of Jerusalem. And he said, you see that little building there with the cupola on top? That is reputed to be the place where Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Here was a city that he loved, he was concerned about. And so he asked them to go and begin their witness at Jerusalem. D.L. Moody, in uh, speak, preaching on this kind of subject once, m m said this. I'll just read it to you, it's very effective. Moody said, I can imagine Jesus saying, Go, search out the man who put the crown of thorns on my brow. Tell him I will have a crown for him in the kingdom if he will accept salvation and there will be no thorns in that crown. Find the man who struck me with the reed driving the thorns deeper into my brow. Tell him I want to give him a scepter. Go out and seek the soldier who drove the spear into my side. Tell him that there is a shorter way to my heart than that. Here was the, the attitude of the Lord to the people of Jerusalem. And so he wanted them to go and begin at Jerusalem, the city that crucified him. But there was one other reason why the Lord wanted them to witness at Jerusalem. And that was that this was Jerusalem's last chance. Jesus, looking down the intervening years, knew that in a few years' time, Titus was going to march against that city and besiege it. And Josephus tells us that when he did that, there were 90,000 Jewish slaves sent away to Rome. More than a million were killed and the streets ran with blood. 115,000 bodies, we are told, were cast out of one of the city gates 10,000 Jews were crucified and the Lord looking down the years saw this coming and so he said to his disciples give the people of Jerusalem the first opportunity of hearing this wonderful message and so they did and for them it was a case of now or never there was a sense of urgency in our Lord's words. And I believe that the Lord is saying something like that to us. We have our Jerusalem where we are. And this is a primary responsibility. They had to begin. It Actually, it doesn't say begin at Jerusalem. It really says beginning from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was only to be the starting point beginning from Jerusalem. Most people think of that uh, verse as saying first in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then in Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the world. But if you look, it doesn't say that at all. It says both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. The Lord's intention was that 
the, those Christians beginning from Jerusalem should with all speed stretch out to Judea and then to Samaria, the place of corrupted religion, and then right out to the uttermost part of the, the world to those who were pagan and without any knowledge of the true God. And so this is God's plan for us. Begin from here, but don't let that be the end of your, your, your vision. Think of Judea, think of Samaria, think of the uttermost part of the earth. And it is in one of those areas that God wants you to exercise your discipleship. But let us come to this passage we read together now. Just picture it. It was the time of our Lord's popularity. A little later, it was dangerous to be seen in Jesus' company. He was a dangerous person. They looked upon him as fomenting sedition. But now he's popular and the crowds are thronging him. It says that great multitudes accompanied him. And then he turned to them and uh, gave this message that we read together. The Lord had a wonderful opportunity of capitalizing on the situation. If he wanted followers, here were thousands of them. And they were ready, they were ready to follow him. But as you read that passage, he takes a very strange line indeed. Instead of flattering them, if I wanted to flatter you, I would say, Oh, what wonderful people you are in Singapore. Isn't it a great honor to me to be asked to speak to a wonderful congregation like this and so on? It would be very easy to flatter a, a congregation, but did Jesus do that with the crowd? No, he did not. It would have been very easy for Jesus to have performed a spectacular miracle so that everybody there was with eyes and mouth open and they would follow him. But he didn't do that. It's very easy to do what... Um, Politicians sometimes do. They give inducements. I've been in places where elections were going on and where they're paying people so much to vote. Oh, you can get a good few votes that way if you give them enough money. But did Jesus uh, throw out any inducements? Indeed he did not. If you read that, it seemed as though he was doing his best to discourage people from following him. He was thinning them out instead of drawing them to him. And it's rather strange to understand why did he do it. We make being a Christian so easy. You know, I feel that we have not presented the gospel as we ought to have done. We have majored on the blessings, the benefits, the excitement, the adventure, the fun if you become a Christian. And thank God it's all true. There's tons of in excitement, there's plenty of adventure, there is fun, there is joy. But that's only part of the story. The Lord was too honest to major on that side of things. Oh, he told the glory and the joy and the wonder of being a, a believer and being a disciple. But he also was absolutely faithful in mentioning the cost. And this is what we have not done in large measure. And that is why so many have gone back and walked no more with the Lord Jesus. In John 6, 66, it says that many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because it was getting too difficult and they hadn't faced up to the cost in the first place. And I believe we ought to be faithful when we're leading people to the Lord. Let them know that salvation is with a view to discipleship. Not merely with a, to get our sins forgiven and not go to hell. But to be a true follower of the Lord who can work with him in building up the church and in battling against the enemy. That's the picture that he's giving here. Building is work. Battling is hard work. And he... Why is he thinning out the crowd? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted men and women of quality. He's not so much concerned with quantity. Oh, he's glad to have quantity provided there's quality with it. But our Lord 
didn't want people to follow him without knowing what was involved. He deprecated a rash, just up and follow him. Robert Browning wrote a poem, I won't re read it all, but the, the first line says this, how very hard it is to be a Christian. Now, there's one sense, and it's very easy to be a Christian. To be saved, all that is necessary is to repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus, and nothing is easier than that if you're prepared to repent of your sin. But there's another side, how very hard it is to be a Christian and walk every day the pathway of discipleship. And in this passage, the Lord is making that clear. In history, the dynamic leaders of all ages and of all nations have found that they have the best response, especially from young men and women, when they make the difficult challenge. Not when they offer the soft option. Today, too many are wanting the soft option. I was talking to a young man in America not very long ago, and uh, it, it, we were talking about missionary work, and he said, oh, you know, he says, I'm thinking that I might take a trip out to Asia and have a look around. And he said, if I feel comfortable about it, I might go back as a missionary. How wonderful. Imagine that. Wouldn't that be an honor to Asia, to have a man with a spirit like that? If I feel comfortable about it. My dear friends, the Lord didn't feel comfortable about the cross. I believe that we need to face up to the cost of discipleship very really. Garibaldi was a great Italian patriot. And at the time of which I'm speaking, uh, the enemy were coming down from the north and invading the country and that the Italy had no adequate army to meet them and looked as if it would be just a walkover for the enemy. But Garibaldi was very loyal to his country and he went about trying to stir up interest among the young men and get them to follow him and go and fight against the enemy. He came to one town and the young fellows were gathered around the street corner as fellows do or they used to do. I don't know whether they do now. But Garibaldi spoke to them and he appealed to them to come and follow him and fight against the enemy, deliver their country. And the young fellows said to him, well, supposing we follow you, what will you give us? Garibaldi said, what will I give you? I'll give you hunger, I'll give you thirst, I'll give you forced marches, I'll give you sleepless nights, I'll give you rags, I'll give you hardships innumerable, but in the end, victory in the noblest cause for which any Italian could fight. Did any of those young men follow him? They all did. They responded to the difficult challenge. And I believe that the Lord in these days, these soft, easy, affluent days in which we are living, the Lord wants to put to us the difficult challenge. How very hard it is to be a Christian. Why did the Lord thin down Gideon's army from 32,000 to 300? Gideon was outnumbered four or five to one at the beginning with the 32,000. Why did Jesus, or did God, bring it down until he had only 300 men? I'll tell you why. He wanted men of quality. Men who would stand the test when the going got difficult. And how wonderfully they responded and what a wonderful victory God gave them. The Lord is looking for picked men and women. I like that verse that says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth 
to show himself strong on behalf of him whose heart is perfect toward him. And I can see the eye of the Lord looking over this congregation. The eyes of the Lord running to and fro throughout the whole congregation. Wanting to show himself strong on behalf of those who are pledged to a true discipleship. Are you going to be among that number? I trust you are. He wants you to be available to him for building his church and for battling against the powers of darkness. You remember when Paul was speaking, he expressed his great desire. He said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fun of his popularity. Do you recognize the verse? Was that what he said? He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is involved in discipleship. If I am going to be a follower of the crucified Lord, then I will de desire and be willing to share in his sufferings in order that men and women might be brought to the Savior. The first condition that Jesus made for a disciple was that they would hate father, mother, brother, sister, wife, child, and hate their own life also. That doesn't sound a very attractive program, does it? You say, I thought the Bible said we're not to hate. Well, the word hate as it's used here is uh, something different from that idea. What does the word hate mean? I think if I put it this way, it simplifies it. To hate, in this sense, means to love less. That's all. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you will love your father and mother, brother, sister, wife, child, and your own life less than you love me. Jesus used the language of exaggerated contrast there. He doesn't mean that we're to hate them in that bad sense. But we are to give him an unrivaled place in our heart's affection. That's the first, first condition, an unrivaled love. He demands from us a love that is greater than our earliest love, our love for father and mother. A love that is greater than our dearest love, a life love for wife or husband or child. A love that is greater than our nearest love, our love for our own selves. And don't we love ourselves? But we are to give him an unrivaled love, first place in our heart's affections. Well then, to measure up to it. Can you say, can I say, that Christ has first place in my heart's affections? Now when you're young... Fellows and girls fall in love. It's a very wonderful experience. One of the great experiences of life. The Lord says that even in that, he wants first place, even more than your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your husband or your wife. You say, well... Does that mean that I won't love my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, my wife and my child as much as I used to? Oh no, it works the other way around. Do you know what happens when you give Christ an unrivaled love? I'll tell you what happens. You get a disease. And the disease is called enlargement of the heart. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happens. If you place Christ first in your affections, the Holy Spirit in a wonderful way sheds abroad the love of God in your heart. 
and you've got greater capacity for love and the result, end result will be you love your father and mother more than you did before and you'll love your wife and child more than you did before because you place him first but that is one of the essential conditions and it doesn't always it isn't always easy to do that sometimes it brings us into conflict I remember when our mission first went into Thailand after we had left China some of our missionaries went into different towns learned the Thai language and began giving the gospel to the people and in this particular town the missionaries had a Bible class I've, I've been to it I know the girl I'm speaking about now where we were there were five million people in that central part of Thailand and there was not a single Thai Christian in the whole area there were no churches there had never been any missionaries it was an entirely virgin area and in at this Bible class there was a girl named Simwang she had never heard of Jesus before she was just a high school girl but she came regularly after school and she just drank in the gospel message and as she learned about the love of the Lord and his death on the cross her heart opened to him just as a flower opens to the sun and she received the Lord as her Savior but after a little while she realized that she would have to let her parents know that she'd become a Christian now every Thai person is a Buddhist they make that their boast that Buddhism is their religion and every to be a Thai is to be a Buddhist and her parents were very loyal Buddhists and she knew that if she when she told her parents this there would be no end of trouble but as she read the scriptures and said that she was to confess with her mouth Jesus as Lord she went to her mother one day and told her that she had become a Christian and had accepted Christ and her mother was furious to think that a daughter of hers should disgrace the family by embracing this foreign religion and she said you'll either give up that religion or you can't stay here you're not going to stay here and be a Christian and here was Simoang facing the test of discipleship will I hate my father my mother my brother my sister will I love them less than I love Christ or will I give up Christ and be able to stay at home what a traumatic decision that was for a young girl young high school girl when there was not an other Christian in the whole area she was the very first well Simoang made the right decision and her mother turned her out and she had to go and as best she could make a living in, in a little while when her birthday came round her mother relented a bit and asked her to come back and they'd have a feast and so they had a feast and afterwards her mother sent her forgot to send her away again but she didn't know when she made that decision she literally hated father and mother for Christ's sake she gave him an unrivaled place in her heart's affection and this is something that he says if you do that you can be my disciple if you're not prepared for that if you want me to come second or third then I'm sorry but you can't be my disciple I can't make use of you to any significant extent in building my church or in battling against the enemy the second condition you'll find in verse 27 where Jesus said whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple the first condition was touching my heart's affections this one is touching my life's conduct when Jesus spoke about the cross what did he mean he hadn't he hadn't gone to the cross yet but everybody in Jerusalem knew what a cross meant every day many criminals were being crucified it was a, a day, a day a daily sight people knew what it meant to bear a cross 
But what did Jesus mean? Uh, many Christians have their own idea of what it means to bear, bear the cross. Some people have a physical infirmity and they say, oh, that's my cross, I've just got to bear that. Some people have got some psychological weakness and they say, oh, that's my cross. Some people have got a bad temper or a sharp tongue and they say, oh, my, my temper is my cross, my tongue is my cross. But it's not at all, you know. Your bad temper or your tongue is the cross of the unfortunate people who have to live and work with you. <laughs> that's, the, that's not the cross at all. When our Lord Jesus took the cross, he did it voluntarily. He didn't have to. It wasn't something that was imposed upon him. You remember he said, No man taketh my light from me, I lay it down of myself. It, he voluntarily took up the cross. And so taking the cross daily is something that you don't have to do. But if you want to be a true disciple, you have to do it. He said, if you don't do it, you can't be my disciple. What does it mean? Obviously, the cross means sacrifice and suffering. That's what it meant to the Lord. We, if we are going to be his true disciples, we'll be prepared to be identified with him in his sacrifice and in his sufferings. Dr. A.W. Tozer, in one of his pungent statements, said this. He said, most of us would rather be happy than feel the wounds of other people's sorrows. Now, I think that's pretty true. Most of us, the thing we want to get out of our Christian life is happiness. And, of course, if we walk the path of discipleship, we'll get it. But very often we make that our pursuit. But Mr. Toza said we ought to be prepared to identify ourselves with the wounds of other people's sorrows. And if I take up the cross and follow Jesus, I'll be prepared to suffer with him in that way. What did the cross mean for Jesus? When they took him and nailed him on that cross outside the city wall, what were they saying? What was the Roman world saying? What was the Jewish world saying? They were saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. They were rejecting the Son of God. The cross is a symbol of the rejection of the world. Now again, our Lord, in being faithful to his disciples said to them a little before this, he said, now don't you be surprised if you're not very popular with the world. He said, the world hated me before it hated you. If the world hates me, it'll hate you also. So we as Christians, and especially as disciples walking the pathway of discipleship, shouldn't be surprised if the world is no friend to us. I'm not suggesting that we should go around and be awkward and try to make, make uh, things difficult for ourselves. Not at all. But if we are really walking in close fellowship with Christ, the world won't be comfortable in our company. We will be a walking conscience in their midst. We won't do the things that they do. We won't do something that's wrong that they do. The, the cross stands for the symbol of the rejection of Christ. And he wants us to be prepared to share his ostracism. The cross is something that thwarts us, something that goes against the grain, something that's painful. It's something that's difficult. And yet the Lord says that every day I am to take up my cross and follow him. But you know, I can give this testimony that those days when I have experienced the greatest joy have been the days when I have most closely followed the Lord bearing my cross. I know it's a paradox, but it's true. Samuel Rutherford, the, uh, whom I mentioned, did I mention last night? I have mentioned anyway. Samuel Rutherford, the Scottish 
divine, said, Whoso looketh upon the white side of Christ's cross and taketh it up handsomely shall find it just such a burden as wings are to a bird. Do you think a bird finds its wings a burden? No, its wings enable it to soar. And what Rutherford was saying was that if we take up the cross and follow the Lord, we'll find that instead of weighing us down, it will bear us up and we will enter into a new experience of joyous fellowship with the Lord. Whoever does not bear his own cross cannot be my disciple. The third condition, unreserved surrender. Verse 33, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I find this uh, the most difficult of the three, perhaps. Did the Lord really mean what he said? Did he really mean that we are to forsake all that we have? You remember Peter came to the Lord and he said, Lord, we have left all and followed thee. That was what discipleship meant to Peter. We have left all. And discipleship sometimes often uh, involves leaving all. When I was a young man in the path of discipleship, one of the things that the Lord asked of me to renounce was my legal profession. A lucrative partnership. And he asked me to do that and I had to make a decision whether I was going to be a disciple or to just be a believer and get all the benefits of salvation without being prepared to follow the Lord in discipleship and be available for his use. How glad I am that I made that right decision. And I think all that's followed in my life has been the outcome of making a right decision at that point in my life. Let him forsake all that he has. The word means to renounce. It's you somewhere else and say goodbye to. So tomorrow morning, I'll tell you what you're to do. You're to get all your possessions and sell them up. You've got some good auctioneers in uh, Singapore. You draw out all your bank balance and you bring them to Jimmy Chu and say, now all these things are for use in navigator work. Do you think that's what Jesus was saying? I don't think so. I think it was meaning something else than that. to bring his disciples to the place where they were not dominated by possessions and things where they, they were not ruled by covetousness and cupidity and the desire to accumulate and get money and prestige and so on he says if you're going to be my disciple, you are to forsake all that you have. You're to renounce it. Now, there are different ways of holding our possessions. There's nothing wrong in having possessions. The Lord doesn't anywhere say it's wrong to have money. All he says is that uh, money is a very dangerous thing. The love of money is the root of all evil. He says that. But he doesn't say it's wrong to have money. It all depends on the way in which you hold it. One way in which we can hold our possessions, whatever it is, money, a bank account, a car, a home, or anything else, is that we can hold it with our fist clenched and say, this is mine, I'll do what I like with it. I'll spend this money any way I like. I'll do what I like with my possessions. That's one way. There's another way, and it's this. You can hold your possessions with your hand inverted like this. Not like this, but like this. And with your fingers just lightly touching. And you say, Lord, all my possessions, everything that I have comes from you. 
You have given it to me. You are the owner. I'm only the trustee. You have given me these possessions to enjoy, and I have enjoyed them. I am enjoying them. But since they are yours and not mine, if you want any of them back again, just let me know and I'll let you have them. Do you see the difference between the two? This is mine. Lord, all that I have is yours. You can have any part of it when you like. We generally think about it in this way. When you get your salary or whatever it is, and you get your money, you work it out. Now, how much of my money am I going to give to God? And that's a good thing to think of it that way, but I'll tell you a better one. How much of God's money am I going to keep for myself? That puts a different complexion on it, doesn't it? Because it's all God's money. He's entrusted us with it. How much of my money am I going to keep for myself? That's that way. How much of God's money am I going to use on myself this way? I was preaching in Christ Church in Bristol about three years ago. And after the service, uh, an elderly gentleman, I call him elderly, he was 87. And uh, he came up to me, he said, Mr. Sanders, I heard you preach at the Keswick Convention in England 32 years ago. He said it was the most expensive sermon I have ever listened to. He said, as a result of that sermon, God asked me to give twice as much as I had been giving before. He said, I, I obeyed the Lord and I gave twice as much and I have been giving twice as much ever since. He said, that was an expensive sermon. Supposing the Lord came to you and said, I want you to give twice as much as you've been giving before. Would it be this, the clenched fist, or would it be this? You see, if you renounce all that you have, you don't count it as your own. You're only the trustee. God is the owner. You remember what Jesus said to the young ruler who came to him and asked what he must do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. You see, he saw that that young man was in the grip of covetousness. He had great possessions, but his great possessions had him. And Jesus saw that he would never follow and become a disciple if he had this kind of attitude. And the young fellow wasn't willing to say goodbye to all that he had. And he went away sorrowful. Of course he did. It's the person who obeys. What does what Jesus said that goes away rejoicing. Now, there, there are the three things that Jesus said were conditions of discipleship. An unrivaled love. An unceasing cross-bearing. An unreserved surrender. Nothing held back. Those are the conditions of discipleship. Are you prepared to conform? You say, my, that's very difficult. And I agree. I agree that those conditions are tremendous. And yet, the Lord of glory, the Lord who loved me and died for me, is the one who made those conditions. You say, well, has he really got the right to ask that of me? I would answer you in this way. Jesus asks nothing of you or of me that he has not already done himself. Take the first one, an unrivaled love. Did Jesus not have for his father an unrivaled love that led him to rise from his heavenly throne, come down to earth, live a life of self-sacrifice in the midst of sinful men and women? Did he not love his father more than his mother, his sister, his brothers, more than his own life also? Did he not? 
then he has the right to say to me that I am to give him an unrivaled love. He tells me I am to take up my own cross and bear it after him. Did he do not do that very thing literally? Did he not take up that cross voluntarily and put it on his back and carry it toward Calvary until he could carry it no longer and someone had to come and help him? And did he not only bear the cross but did he not die on the cross? Has he not then the right to say, I want you to come and identify yourself with me in my suffering and in my rejection by the world? He tells us that we are to say goodbye, to renounce, to forsake all that we have. Is that not what he did? When he rose from his heavenly throne and came down to earth, as he descended the heavens, he littered space with the glories he laid aside. When he came to earth, he didn't come to be born in a, in a golden cradle, in a palace. He was born in a manger, in an eastern inn. He came to live with ordinary working parents. He became an ordinary working man. When he engaged on his ministry, he was dependent upon what others, what the women gave him. The women ministered to him. You think what that was, when the angels were looking on and they saw the Lord of glory who was the heir of all things and there the women were giving him money to live on. You think what that meant. And when at last it came to the end and our Lord's estate was being lodged for probate and the lawyers put in the schedule showing the goods he had how much did they say was, was his, were his possessions all they could enter was one garment that's all he had when he came into the world he came in a little naked baby when he went out of the world he had renounced all that he had and all that was left was one single garment. Has he got the right to ask of me that I say farewell to all that I have and hold it as something which is a sacred trust from him? I believe that this is our great privilege not only our responsibility, but what a privilege to follow a Lord like that. And don't forget, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Shall we bow for a few moments in quietness and just meditate on what we have been thinking about? Shall we just bow in prayer? Our Father, we pray that your Spirit will speak to our hearts through your Word, that indeed we might love you with an unrivaled love, that we might surrender to you in an unreserved way. We might be willing to bear the cross and renounce all to follow you. Help us, Lord, and thank you for the promises of your grace when we do this. In Jesus' name.